Today is January the 4th, 2012. My name is Dr. Michael Berna, and I'm here today on behalf of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project, a project that captures and archives the oral histories of the men and women who served in one or more of our nation's conflicts. We are in Manesson, Pennsylvania, at the Manesson Heritage Museum today to interview Mr. Joseph Gallo, a veteran of the United States Navy. Welcome, Mr. Gallo, and thank you for agreeing to share your military experiences with the rest of the nation. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Mr. Gallo, let's start with some background information about, about you, beginning with when and where you were born. I was born in Manesson, Pennsylvania, the last of four children. I had four older sisters who were all born in Italy. I was the only one from my family born in this country. And what year was that? When I was born, 1930. 1930. Okay. And you grew up in Manesson and lived here Spent all of your life? Outside of uh, college and military service, my entire life was spent here. Okay. And college, where did you go to college? I went to Penn State Extension in McKeesport and graduated there with a two-year program as an associate in engineering. Okay. Obtained a job at Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel and ended up as a layout draftsman and then I was a turn foreman, was promoted to turn foreman in the blast furnace and open hearth and BOF departments in Manesson. And how long were you there? I spent my whole career there, 30 years. Okay. Those, those steel industry days are gone now, aren't they? The steel industry has gone, right. I mean, I don't know what's happening now, but uh, in my opinion, if we end up in some sort of a war, how are we going to protect ourselves? Of course, today, technology will do it. Mm -hmm. You don't need manpower. Right, yeah. right, as we, as we see day to day on the news. Right. Right. Well, let's back up to to your high school days, or, or the, maybe the earliest days, when you could remember feeling some sort of sense of, of military uh, that you you might even consider something like that. Tell us about how you first got interested in the military. Well, I got interested in the military not as an underclassman, but during my high school days I worked in a service station. Cherokee's gas station down at the east end of Manesson. My family wanted me to go to college. At that time, I was making $35 a week. I had a 1934 Pontiac. I was enjoying myself. I did not think I needed college. But after working for a year, two, three years after high school, I realized that wasn't my bag. So I ended up enlisting in the United States Navy in 1951 and there I started. What made you what made you choose the Navy and what made you even consider the military as an option? Well the Korean War had just started and I had a brother-in-law that uh, was in the service in the Second World War and he was in the Battle of the Bulge in Europe. He ended up getting captured and he lost a ton of weight. He came home, I think he was like 90 pounds. And uh, I thought, that's nothing for me. So I figured in the Navy, at least I'd sleep in a bed and I wouldn't have to sleep in a foxhole. So I went to the Navy other than getting drafted. Mm -hmm. So that was my choice at that time. You, you wanted to not be drafted. You wanted to yes. have your own decision. Right. Okay. So you left Manesson and uh, tell us about your travels to basic training. How did you get, where was basic training and how did you get there? Well, there were three of us from the Mon Valley, one from Denora, one from Valvernon, and myself from Manesson that went in at the same time. We drove into Pittsburgh. We had a one of the fellows' dad drove us in. We were sworn in in Pittsburgh. After the swearing ceremony, 
the uh, military person that uh, swore us in said, welcome to the armed service. They ships us over to the train station. We got on a sleeper train and we traveled all night to our Great Lakes Naval Training Center in Great Lakes, Michigan. And we started basic training there. What was your first impression when you, when you arrived? Great I enjoyed it. Frankly, it was the first time I was really any distance from, uh, from home outside of going to Pittsburgh quite frequently with my car. But, uh, uh, and we enjoyed, they gave us, they gave us uh, top of the line service and top of the line uh, foods and whatever. In fact, we even had sleeper cars. We slept uh, the night over going into, from here to Chicago until we got into Great Lakes. And then uh, we started our basic training. Now, did the two other gentlemen from the valley, were they along with you? Yes, they were along with us. And uh, in fact, we were in the same company doing boot training, which was 13 weeks. 13 weeks. Right. Following the 13 week training in boot camp, we were interviewed. I had gone, when I was in Manesson High School, I had gone to the vocational school. I had machine shop training. During this interview, the people had uh, a, uh, the fact that I had gone to uh, the machine shop, they figured the best thing for me to do would to become a machinist mate in the service. It sounded okay to me. Of course, we didn't know what was ahead. Okay. So I agreed and they put me down with that. Do you want me to continue? Yes, please. Okay. Once we uh, ended up, uh, we parted company, the three of us. I was the only one that went to the machinist mate school. Prior to machinist mate school, they herded the whole gang of us, not only our company, but four companies, and they took what was called a, a GCT, a general classification test. This test was designed for people to go to Annapolis if they qualified. Well, we went to this big room, all of us actually, we went to this big room, this general, gen general classification test, if you scored 60 or above, you went to this class to take a test for this, as I mentioned before, Annapolis. They had in this room, I would venture to say 200 recruits. They were only going to take two. Needless to say, I did not make it going to Annapolis. So from there, they shipped me still at Great Lakes Training Center to another 13-week school, which was called the Machinist Mate School. And we had additional schooling from there. So we went and finished that school. That was the last I saw of my two friends from the Mon Valley. Following the Machinist Mate School, they had once again, our class was something like 27, 28, I think. They herded us into a room and they marked assignments on the blackboard. And of the 27 of us, my rating was number two. And those were assignments. According to our, our situation, how we ranked in this machinist mate school is how we picked our jobs. The person that was with uh, first, I had my eye on the job I wanted, so the it ended up he did not pick what I wanted. The fellow was from California, he picked something on the west coast, which was beautiful for me, so I was number two. So I picked my assignment in the engineering department of the USS Kimberly DD-521 which at that time was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Brooklyn, New York. It was a destroyer, It was right? a tin can, as we called it. Tin can. A destroyer, yes. The, uh, so once I went there, uh, they assigned me to the, uh, the crew that was in the machinist mate group. 
And we stayed there for about another two weeks, I would say, while the repairs were finished because it was a Brooklyn Navy Yard where they did repair work on ships. Then we ended up going out to sea for a shakedown, which was just one day, and we came back into the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And the engineers checked over things before they released the, the ship itself. So, <clears throat> excuse me, once we uh, were released, we left, went down the coast to Norfolk, Virginia. Now, Norfolk, Virginia, which I found out then, was our home port. Okay, we stayed there roughly a week, week and a half. Then we ended up, we got our assignment. We were to go to Korea. At that time, we did not know what was in store for us. But now that everything is behind us, it was a wonderful experience. I can, I'll live with it for the rest of my life. Let me preface my next few remarks by saying the fact that I was on a small ship, a little over 300 people were on the ship. It was about 320 uh, feet long, roughly uh, uh, 2,100 ton. It was a family rather than the big cruisers, battleships, aircraft carriers that had roughly three to 4,000 manpower. So because we were on a family, they treated us as a family. We intermingled with the officers, and it wasn't uh, regimentation like is on the great big ships, okay? So from there, we went on what was to be a cruise around the world. Okay, we started with a shakedown cruise of 10 days down to Cuba. There we ended up working with shakedown cruises with battleships, cruisers, submarines. During my four years with the service, I made roughly three shakedown cruises similar. The Navy at that time did uh, this particular type of a cruise preparing you to go elsewhere to work. On one of the cruises, shakedown cruises, our captain received a request from a submarine that we were going to operate with that day, which gave me a, a lovely experience. There were eight people on that submarine who had never been on a surface craft. They wanted to exchange a day with eight people from our destroyer so that they could be on a surface craft for a day. Well, our captain sent message around, anybody would like to volunteer. So I volunteered from the engineering department. They took eight people, one from each department. And that was an experience, operating 110 feet below sea level, traveling about 18 knots an hour for the entire day. And because of that, I had one day experience on a submarine. And the eight of us, when we left, the captain of the submarine gave us a laminated card, which I still have, as honorary member of the USS Tench which was wonderful. This is another part of the thing that I say family. If I was not on a small ship, this would not have come to pass. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we had did that shakedown cruise going out with the, one day with the battleship, one day with the cruiser, one day with the submarine, until our 10 days was up. We came back to, to uh, our home port of Norfolk, we stayed there just long enough to make preparations, and then we left on our, what we found out was to be a round-the-world cruise. We left 
roughly, we were still in 1952. We went down toward Panama. We went through the Panama Canal. I don't know if everyone knows, but the Panama Canal is a series of three locks. You go into the Panama Canal, you go into a lock, they fill it up with uh, water, and they raise you three feet. It's similar to our locks here at, uh, at Lock 4. Then you go into another lock, raises you another 30 feet, and then you go into a third lock. So you are raised from the level of the ocean roughly 90 feet. When you leave the third lock, you go into what is called a freshwater lake. That freshwater lake, we end up going across the Isthmus of Panama and come out to the other side. On the other side, the same process. You go into the first lock, you go down 30 feet. You go into the second lock, you go down 30 more feet, and the same thing on the third lock, and then they let us out on the Pacific Ocean. At the Pacific Ocean, we made a stop in a place called Panama City. At Panama City, we had just one evening of liberty. We just stayed there, so we walked around Panama. There was not much there to see, but we, it was Panama City. Okay, so on May the 15th of 1952, a squadron of four destroyers, ours being one of them, the USS Kimberly, left Norfolk and headed into toward San Diego. Once again, San Diego we stopped, and once again we had liberty. A few of us went down to Tijuana, Mexico. That was the big thing then to go to Mexico. So we went to Mexico and bargained with the Mexican people about uh, what to buy and what not to buy. On the 31st of May, we left for Pearl Harbor. On June 6th, this is another experience that uh, I don't know how many people have, but at that time, the, the uh, department that fed us, okay, commissary as it was called, their garbage, they threw it off the fantail, which is the back part of the ship. And there were porpoises galore that would always follow the ship because they knew they'd get a good meal, okay. But this one time, this is something that happens when you're on a small ship. You have a lot of rocking and waving and things like that. The person that was from the commissary that dumped the garbage over had a man overboard. He fell overboard. So at that time, our ship was designated to stay back to find the fellow that was a man overboard. Because we were going 18 knots an hour, you know what I mean? And he's gone, naturally. So our ship stayed back, and we went back in, searched the area where he fell, and we found him. He was still floating, and uh, uh, we run the ship. Our captain run the ship alongside of him. They threw him some, uh, a couple of life jackets. They dropped our boat, the, the uh, boat captain of our little boat that has three-man crew, an engineer, and a couple of uh, boat hands, and they picked him up. He was 45 minutes in the water by the time we found him and picked him up which was a good experience. So for, for a, 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 a ship that has a family atmosphere, you had to have a, a sense of real pride and, and uh, right. excitement that you were able to really rescue this man. And that they were to found him. That's amazing. I mean, that was the amazing part, where they had found him, because uh, when this happened and they heard about it and made the decision that our ship was the one to go get him, they, they rang what was called general quarters. It was battle stations. In other words, everybody had to go to where they went for battle. And uh, I guess the sonar people or whoever does the radar and whatever that, that's not my department, they knew the exact location where he had fallen off. And uh, 
So that's how we were able to find him. I'm sure okay. he was happy too. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we run into that. The fellow came up safe. Incidentally, he was not from our ship. He was one of the other four, the other three ships from our squadron. But I guess our ship was a little man on a totem pole, evidently. We did not have the full captain on our ship. We had a lieutenant commander that was our captain, okay? So we arrived at Pearl Harbor. Then we went into the uh, Pearl Harbor dry dock. We couldn't understand what had happened that we had just come out of, out of a Brooklyn Navy Yard shortly before that, and here we were going into dry dock, there was something wrong. Well, a tin can has two screws, okay, and the screws that go through to become the propellers at the end, you know, the, uh, the long shaft that is driven by, the, by us from the engine room, goes to a wooden bearing. It's called uh, wood called lignum vitum, and something was wrong with that. So this uh, is what they had to repair. So we went into dry dock on the 7th of June. And what does dry dock mean? Dry dock means the ship goes up and it is put on blocks, and all the water is taken out, and you can walk down inside and see the inside of the ship from the bottom up. You see the propellers, and you see the, uh, the bow and the stern, and you see the, the ship itself, the outside, okay? Mm -hmm. So we were there for three days. During that time, I got another experience, because once again, our ship was a family. We were allowed to go down and look and see what was going on, where they were fixing that. And I have a picture that I had taken uh, one of our buddies and so forth of us standing alongside the screws. The screws, I was five foot ten inches tall, and the screws, I couldn't reach the top of the screw. And that's a small ship. So you can imagine the size of the big destroyer, big uh, cruisers and going up that have four screws rather than us with just two, okay? On the 11th, we arrived at Midway Island. Now, Midway Island, once again, every one of these stops, we're not in the military. We're not in a war zone yet, okay? These were all stops for the crew to get off the ship and so forth and so on. The big highlight of Midway Island was the type of birds that they had there. They called them goonie birds, okay? Now, they were a branch of the albatross. And they were friendly birds. I mean, evidently they were tame, and uh, you could walk in amongst them. One of the characteristics that they had, they would run, I guess like our turkey today. They have to run and then fly. They couldn't just fly like the small birds we have around here. They had to run, get a start, and then fly. And an interesting, very interesting point of that I read an article, I'll bet you 40 years later, that the Goonie birds were gone from Midway. Very shortly after we left there, someone had brought fruit into the island for the people that lived there and had introduced a tree climbing snake. And that tree climbing snake multiplied on the island and it killed all of the goonie birds. It, during a course of 40 years, though, it took. Not by eating the birds, but by getting in the nests and eating the eggs. And this was, I read that in, a, in an article in a newspaper that, about the goonie birds, and this was unbelievable to me. Oh, it brought memories, yes. Mm -hmm. So there are no goonie birds now on Midway. And so the, now, as you, so for someone who has just left uh, Manesson, not not long before that, here you are making your journey across mm -hmm. the world here, all these different ports. Each new port had to be exciting for you. This was, to me, it was unbelievable. Because I came from an Italian family that, uh, when I went to a grocery store with a nickel, I bought uh, 
five cents a baker yeast. My mother used to make bread. Everything else we lived off the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My dad was a farmer and we had chickens and geese and goats and so forth. So we didn't have to do much shopping mm -hmm. for food. We had our own food. When you were in Pearl Harbor, did you have any sense of, of what it must have been like for the attack of Pearl Harbor? While I was in Pearl Harbor, we were given time to go visit the Arizona, the USS Arizona. Now that was, bear in mind now, this is 1952. It was only six or seven years after Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And they had not built anything yet there. But they had contemplated making that a, an anniversary uh, and a memorial of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The only thing that we saw of the USS Arizona was a little bit of the superstructure, which was up on top, okay? And they were, today, I went there with my family in 1992, okay, and it's unbelievable what they've done there. I mean, and what impressed me, there are quite a few, they have a big uh, plaque of uh, the uh, people that went down with the ship, and they're still down there, okay. Mm -hmm. They have a big memorial plaque designating the names of all the people that were killed there. One other point that surprised me, alongside of that plaque is a smaller plaque with born names. I increased, I inquired with our tour guide who took us there when I was there with my family, what, uh, what, was, that, what was that all about? He says, these are shipmates of the people that were killed that chose to be buried with their shipmates. Hmm. Most of them are little canisters that they have, uh, the bodies that are gone down there, but the jar and the canister of the people that uh, died are down there. And they have their list of names down there, which was very interesting. And that uh, is growing. With, so you uh, saw the before and the after. I saw the before and the after. And mm -hmm. it, uh, it was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Later on, we left uh, on the 11th, and we only stayed there one day. This was the, uh, we're back to the Midway, okay? You, you brought me back to, uh, <laughs> you brought me back to Pearl Harbor. But anyway, back on Midway, we left Midway on the 12th of June, and we crossed what was called the International Date Line, okay? And that's an interesting point because we continued, continually went west. Every time we crossed the time zone, we lost an hour because we were going west, okay? You pick up that 24 hours when you cross the date line. You go to bed Tuesday night, you get up Thursday morning. And that's, so that was another interesting point that we had going across the international yeah, date line. that would be interesting. See, and, uh, and they documented that, that we crossed the date line aboard the ship, you know, mm -hmm. and they told us all what was happening. Then we arrived in what was called, this was the 18th, we arrived at Yokosuka, Japan, okay? We arrived there, and we, I had liberty. And a friend of mine from Manesson was stationed there. He was a shoemaker by trade, lived in Manesson, and worked at a shoemaker, his uncle's shoemaker shop in Shalroy at the time. He was, went in the service after I did, but he did not go to school. So because he had the shoemaker experience, he ran the shoemaker store on the Navy base at Yokosuka, Japan. Okay which was very interesting to go see him in his shoe shop. He asked me if my shoes were all right. I says, my shoes are okay. But at that time, what they wanted to do, they had soles roughly that thick. They'd make lock thick soles on the Navy shoes of the people that were wearing. I guess that was a trend at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Okay, then we, uh, on the 23rd, we left for Korea. And that was our first into the battle zone. Now, you, you, this was in 1951. Two. 52. 
Yeah. Okay, so the Korea was kind of at its height, the Korean War at that time. It's, right. it's been about a year and a half into the right. conflict now. Right. And, and uh, so what was the mood of the group going, knowing they were going into the war zone? Well, I'll tell you what. At that time when we were going into the war zone, everybody carried a life jacket with them. And that's unusual, because mm -hmm. today if you go on a cruise ship, people don't like to put a life jacket on. But over there, once you were in the battle zone, you uh, kept your life jacket with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, now, our job was twofold. Our ship, which I said was small, we had five-inch guns, and we fired the five-inch guns into North Korea as our first job. And because we were such a small ship, they had uh, a setting, an electronic setting, on the barrels of the, the five-inch 38 guns that when you stood on the ship, it looked like the barrels were moving. But yet, the barrels weren't moving, we were moving. Ooh. And that, that was an interesting thing that I liked when I first saw that, and then mm -hmm. I realized what was happening. Mm -hmm. They had those uh, five-inch uh, barrels set for the uh, targets. And they, our ship rocked and listed and up and down, and, but the, the barrel itself stayed where it belonged. Okay. How far offshore were you? We saw shore. Now, Aboard, in the water, you can see the horizon is eight miles, okay? But offshore, I wouldn't say maybe a mile, because we were able to see shore, you know, I mean, when we fired. Now, the, we also operated, we never operated alone. We always operated with a battleship, okay? Our battleship was the USS Iowa, along with shooting our five-inch guns, the battleship shot 16-inch guns, mm. okay? Now, while we were both firing, our job was to go and move around the battleship for two reasons. We were protection for the battleship. A guinea pig, so to speak, to keep an eye out for torpedoes. Mm. The battleship is worth a lot more than a destroyer. Mm -hmm. A battleship had, the one we were operating with, had 3,300 people versus our 300. Mm -hmm. So now, as I mentioned earlier, we had a squadron of four destroyers. They each had a battleship. One of our, our destroyers, the USS Van Valkenburg, did pick up a torpedo, mm. which was meant for their battleship which I don't know what the name was of that battleship, but it hit the forward fire room. There was five-man crew working down there at the time. They were all killed. Now, what the, uh, the people did on that ship, they buttoned it up. In other words, closed the hatches and made it watertight so that water was flooding that particular fire room, which meant that ship only had one screw because a fire room takes care of one screw. So what happened, that destroyer headed back to Subic Bay, the Philippine Islands, into dry dock. We never saw it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had to repair it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the five people were killed. That's the only, during my four years in the service, that's the only experience I had of people getting killed. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what were the targets that you were shooting at at that time? We don't know. You don't know. I I I don't know what that stuff was. Okay. I know it was North Korea. That's all I. That's all we know. Okay. As far as the targets, we have no idea. Okay. So, like I say, I, my job was propulsion of the ship. Right. Okay. It wasn't uh, firing. It wasn't that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay. The other job we had down in the engine room was uh, evaporators. We made uh, fresh water out of seawater. Mm -hmm. was used for cooking and showers and so forth. Those were the two jobs that, that I was involved with. Was it noisy down there? Oh, yes. And uh, we had big fans. Sometimes it would get up to 100, 110 degrees. We had fans blowing us, blowing on us uh, continuously mm -hmm. 
because it was so hot. Mm -hmm. And what they did, uh, the steam-driven uh, turbines that were in our engine room were run by steam. And steam is hot, okay, mm -hmm. and that gets the uh, room hot. But then we had condensing units that melted the steam back into water, okay. And what, how we did that to keep some of the coolness out was to keep the uh, condensing units under a vacuum. So they, theoretically, there were only 100 degrees, but yet they, they did the work of 212 degrees. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but anyway, that's what we had uh, as our, our chore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we stood bombarding and we were back and forth doing this, this kind of uh, operations all the way into uh, roughly uh, a month, month and a half, which brings us roughly to the, uh, the end of June, beginning of July, okay? At that time, we ended up, they took us off and they sent us to a, a inland isthmus where we were to look for what was called sampans. Now sampans were small little boats run by three, or they were no motor, they were our oars that people had to maneuver them around, but yet they had word somewhere that they had ammunition which we were going after, okay? And we had to go into these things. Now, this was at night, and this was when anybody walking around carried a life jacket. That was for sure. But anyway, this is what we had to do, look for, for sampans loaded with, with this ammunition based for land-based bases, okay? But uh, in our tour there, three or four days, we never did find anything. Hmm. We'd go back out in the daylight, go back in at night, okay? Bear in mind, this is 50 years ago. Technology wasn't what it is today. If we'd have gone in there, my opinion, if we'd have gone in there today, we'd have been located in a, in a flash, and been killed or whatever. Today, today is altogether different than what it was in the 50s, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, the guard duty, we had, again, looking for these sandpans, okay? On the 19th of August, they sent us to Yokuska alongside a destroyer tender. We stayed there for a few days for maintenance work, okay? And we left for a, do a few days for what they called, they told us, anti-submarine warfare. We were going after Japanese subs. And there were three days that we threw out uh, depth charges. Once again, that wasn't my job, okay. But the people that worked on those, Schumann, I don't recall if we hit anything or we scared them away or what, but uh, there were only like three times that we did that, of the, all the period that we were in that area doing anti-submarine warfare, mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> Then we went to a, a few other cities to stop for just a little bit of recreation. We left the battle zone at that time, okay? And you were in a battle zone for how long? Roughly uh, six weeks, something okay. like that, five, six weeks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then we headed to a couple of cities. We stopped overnight, Hakodati, Omanado. Then we left for Formosa. A Formosa was a four-day stop. Now, there was a, a tremendously interesting thing when we got into Formosa. When we got into Formosa, the people that were there were unbelievable. They were in little wee boats all around us, asking for us to throw coins out or throw anything out. We'd throw a half a dollar out. Their guy would dive into the water, come back up with that coin in his teeth, and show us the coin. <laughs> And this was, this was something, okay? And while we were there, we didn't know this was happening. But evidently, uh, they made some kind of an arrangement 
with our, our captain. When we eat lunch, all of our meals, we eat them in, called the mess hall. We eat them on heavy, heavy aluminum trays, which have six <coughs> different locations for whether it's meat, potatoes, or whatever, okay? And what we would do when we'd finish eating, we'd bang those trays on a garbage can, and that's what they would dump over the fantail where we had that man overboard, okay? Mm -hmm. But once we ate our first meal in Formosa, no, no, it was different. There were six Korean, not Korean, uh, ladies from Formosa there. The first one took our tray. We didn't know what was happening, okay? They took our tray, she turned it around, put the meat in a dish, passed it over to the next lady, she put the potatoes in a dish, moved to the next person, she put the vegetables in a dish, the dessert that we had left. These were leftovers mm -hmm. that they put in the dish. And they did that for the four days we were there. Needless to say, we always made sure they had something left on our plates whenever we found out what was going on. You know. mm -hmm. In return for that, these same ladies, the ship itself provided the paint. Battleship Gray was what we used in those days. That's what it was called. They hung from the deck of our ship and painted, hanging on a cable. They painted from the waterline up to the top of the deck, wow. all the way around the ship. The last day we were there, those six ladies. Amazing. That was that was I've never seen anything like that. They realized they were getting something for nothing. Okay. So those four days we spent there. Back to let's see, we went back to Korea again. Okay. We went back to Korea, we had more shore bombardment, additional we had information. We had guard duty with a British man of war ship, uh, His Majesty's ship Ocean. I don't know what we did there, but we were following that British ship along. It was much bigger than ours, but they were part of the thing, okay? We did that for a few days, okay? Okay, back to, all right. Once we left Formosa, we uh, went to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, once again, we got all the people that wanted us to throw coins out. Once again. But in Hong Kong, we did not get the people going after our food. For most of we did. Okay, so that, that covered that. All we had there was patrol duty. Okay, we had 10 days of that. One of those days, we had a big typhoon came in and hit uh, Hong Kong. Well, what they did with us that day, we went out to sea, and we rode it. Quite a few of the members of our ship got sick. Uh, quite a few of them. And people were throwing up all over the place. Okay. Mm. I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't, uh, I didn't get, uh, well, the reason, I think, our engineering uh, sleeping quarters was in the back, right at the fantail right underneath the, uh, and we saw the screws going by us, okay. And uh, what we did, we learned to sleep in the noise because a small tin can, when you ride the waves, you have to ride them perpendicular to the wave, not parallel. Mm -hmm. So what happens, your, your ship goes up and then it comes back down. When it comes back down, your screws come out of the water, and they speed up, and it makes terrific noise in that back compartment, hmm. which we learned to live with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we learned to live with that. So, like I say, that was another interesting point. But I never figured I'd be able to sleep there when I first saw it. But you learn. You learn. You adjust. You, you adjust, and it works out. So that took care of that. So once again, we were back to. Formosa again, 
They begged us back to Formosa for two more days, which was two more days of food for the people. Okay, this time they didn't paint the. They got the food for free, I guess, this time. But right. they didn't have to paint the. And then we left. The end of the war zone, for good. We headed to the Philippine Islands. Mm -hmm. We arrived in Super, Subic Bay, the Philippine Islands. And that was when I saw all of the uh, <coughs> things that were there. Okay, we had uh, we had a shipmates pulled the party for us. Okay, and they uh, we stayed there like ten days. Then we left on the seventeenth. We're into October now, the 17th of October. We left for Singapore, okay? Now, in Singapore, once again, a little more liberty. 23rd, we left for Colombo Salon. During our trip for Colombo Salon, we crossed the equator. Now, I don't think the military would be allowed to do this anymore now, but we were initiated. Until you cross the equator in the Navy, you're considered a polywog. Once you cross the equator, you're considered a shellback. Okay. So when we were crossing the equator, we had to go through ceremonies. The first thing we went through, naturally I was a polywog, okay. First thing we had an old chief had nothing on but a diaper. <laughs> Around his belly button was lipstick. We had to kiss his belly button to go to the next station. Okay, The next station was Waters of the Seven Seas. We had to jump in that water. Two shellbacks were standing there pushing our heads down in the water. We'd come out and if we'd say polywog, he'd let us go. I mean, if we'd say shellback, he'd let us go. Few of the guys were obstinate. They kept staying polywog. They kept pushing them down in that water till they'd come back up. After they got enough water in them, they'd say shellback. <laughs> and they went. Then the next place we went, they had a chute of trash. We had to crawl through that chute of tra oh. trash. And while we were crawling through that chute of trash, two of the shellbacks would smack us in the rear end with a with a stick, you know, and so we, we'd go faster, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's a little bit of what we had to do. But then after that, we were issued a, a card that called us shellbacks. So we were initiated to what they called the ancient order of the deep. <laughs> See, this is once again family. Right. That stuff didn't happen when there were 3,300 people. Right, so right. This is why I say I got the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. This is the way I feel about it today, mm -hmm. looking back. Sure. Okay. Great experience. Right. So once again, we uh, crossed the equator. We got into Colombo. Then they stopped us once again to Ras Tanura, Arabia. Okay. At Ras Tanura, Arabia, there was nothing there. But what our ship's captain organized a uh, smoker where we had a couple of our guys from that volunteered, people that boxed. They would box there and they had two fights. Two fights there were just regular boxing. The reason they did that, to make some entertainment, we had a lot of Americans that were there because they were oil, they were oil drilling there. Mm -hmm. And what they did was provide a smoker to give some entertainment to the people that lived there, mm -hmm. that were Americans, okay? That was the smoker there, and, and we entertained them for then. We left on uh, November the 5th, we left for Aden, Arabia, which is another, the other end of, which is at the entrance of the Suez Canal. And we stopped in uh, Arabia. Now, myself, I enjoyed it because we had liberty there and there were a lot of Italians there. Hmm. And I speak the language. But yet, it's unbelievable how in today's uh, languages from many, many years ago, Italy, 
whatever section of Italy you came from, you had a dialect from that Italy. And many of the people that were the Italians there, as soon as I'd open my mouth, they'd say right off the bed, oh, tu sei Calabrese. In other words, you came from Calabria. In other words, the section of Italy that had that dialect. Mm -hmm. Because up until uh, Giuseppe Garbaldi unified Italy, Italy was a series of small communities with with uh, walls around them. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, Pompeii. Pompeii was a walled city until it was killed in, what, 79 AD, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, once it was killed, nobody bothered it for roughly 300 years because it was, they, everybody was isolated at that time. Mm -hmm. They had their own little communities, okay? Okay, so we, uh, we uh, left Aden, Arabia, and we went through the Suez Canal. Okay, now, the Suez Canal is nothing like the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal is an engineering marvel. The Suez Canal is nothing but a ditch. Hmm. In other words, the elevation of the water in the Indian Ocean is the same as the elevation of the water at the Mediterranean Sea, huh. which takes you through, the Suez Canal takes you through past Egypt right into the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, so it's, but it's small. Destroyers can get through there, but the bigger ships cannot. Mm, they have to go around. They have to go around, right? Mm -hmm. They have to go around through the Straits of Gibraltar mm -hmm. okay, to get into the Mediterranean. But anyway, we went there, and the rest of the cruise was recreation for us. We went to uh, different, first stop was uh, Naples. Now, once again, I'm referring again to family. A small ship like I was on, whenever they got into a foreign country, you were able to visit family if you had family in that country. At that time, I had an aunt and her family still living in southern Italy. So what there were, I think, three of us that had family in Italy. Their policy on the small ship was to let you go as long as we were in that port. So I boarded a train in Naples, went all the way down south into a Mongoni Cosenza, which is a town that my family was all born in, except for me. Mm. And I saw for my first time my mother's youngest sister, mm. <coughs> who was living there. And uh, I met a bunch of nephews and nieces, and, and I stayed there the, the four days. But an interesting thing, my eyes were open. This is 1952 now. Dirt floor they lived in. No, no uh, running water. Fireplace with an iron bar that you pulled out. They lived on what was called one dish meals. They had a one dish meal, you know, what we call minestrone maybe or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they put the pan in there and ate. But Deviating for a little while, I was surprised because I came back again from another cruise in 54 when I was on a, a different uh, ship and uh, I got down there again for another five days. During that second trip, they had everything. They had wooden floors, concrete floors, they had bathrooms, they not only had toilets, they had bidets alongside the toilet in the two-year period. Progress. Isn't that something, how they went in a two-year period? That is something. Yeah. But anyway, going back to my first trip, they uh, told me that uh, how they got their water, they had a what was called a Fontana Grande, Grand Fountain. And they told me that my dad had helped bring water down from the mountain. And they had a place where the water came, they had a concrete set up on a hillside, and they had a face embedded in the concrete, and out of the mouth of the, the face, water ran and ran into a trough. Okay? That trough ran maybe 15, 16 feet. It was concrete, okay? and then it turned and went 15 feet the other way, and then it went over a hill. 
and it was gone, of course. But the way they had it, <coughs> the people that had light colored clothes would wash their clothes in that water on the first 15 feet. People that had greasy, dirty clothes that were gardening, muddy and stuff, they'd have to go on that lower side because they washed on the same water that the first 15 feet were. Hmm, interesting. And uh, I found out from my aunt <coughs> that they beat their clothes on what they called white stones, but it was actually unfinished marble. Because hmm. marble is, comes from Italy, it's marble comes pretty cheap there. Right. Okay? And that's the way they washed their clothes. But anyway, that's back to Naples, Italy. So I returned from uh, there, and our ship left on the 22nd, left for Genoa. And we had four days' liberty there. Then we left for Cannes, France. Four days' liberty there. Then we left for Gibraltar, and we got to stop there for a couple of days. The Rock of Gibraltar that uh, the insurance company talks about, and mm -hmm. we got to see that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, following that, we left on December 2nd to cross the uh, Atlantic Ocean to come back to Norfolk. And that was a trip that we took around the world. Now, to slip through the rest of uh, my four years, I stayed on that ship again. We went overseas again. Never like this, though. We went, uh, <coughs> our ship went uh, over Europe, but I was on a different ship then. Once we got back to Norfolk, we ended up, they took us down to uh, North Carolina. And at North Carolina, we decommissioned the ship. It was a DD-52100, and it was an older type. At that time, they were coming in with 2,250-ton ships, which were bigger, carried a few more people, but they were still destroyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, ours, we decommissioned it, and uh, they uh, left it down there at North Carolina. When I got back in North Carolina, they put me on a repair ship, which was a little bigger, and it had roughly 600 uh, people on board. And what they did, once again, I was in a machine shop. Because of my trade, they put me in a machine shop. And I worked there. And what uh, we did, our first trip to Korea, we went alongside repair ships for jobs that had to be done. For my second ship, we did the doing. Mm -hmm. In other words, smaller ships would come alongside us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I spent a little bit of time on the end until we got to 1955. My, my uh, tour was up. I had gotten to a pay grade of E5. And uh, they asked me, this is, once again, tempting. They asked me if I wanted to ship over for six years. They offered me the next pay grade, which was first class, which would have been E6, and $6,000 cash. A lot of money back then. In 1955, to sign up for six more years. I says, no thanks, I want to go home. <laughs> so I came home. So anything else? Well, I, I must say, what, what an interesting story yeah. for someone from Manesson to travel all around the world and get to see, not only see places, but get to have so many opportunities. A yeah. submarine, you get to see people in different cultures, yeah. you, you, you saw, experienced the war zone, what that was yeah. like. Uh, unfortunately, some of our, our servicemen were killed along yeah. that way. You saw where World War II began at Pearl Harbor. All of these things that you would have never seen without a career in the military, and your decision to to get into the Navy was was definitely the right decision for you. And fortunately for the yeah. gentleman from California, he chose the West Coast position so that you could you could get the job that you wanted. Yeah. And uh, what a wonderful experience yeah. for you, and and also what great service to our country for for quite some time. Yeah. You you took some time out of your life to serve your country. And, and that was a, a very uh, significant thing to do. Another thing that I can add that, yes, I gave them four years. 
but they are still giving me, believe it or not, because I go to the VA, I get medications from the VA, and uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, they, I save money that way. I came out, my college, by the way, was after I came out. Okay. I went out on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And I went to the college that I talked to you about, Penn State Extension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where I ended up getting hired at Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel in the engineering department there. Mm -hmm. So like I say, my, uh, my life has been in the engineering field uh, up until they made a boss out of me. Mm -hmm. And then when they made a boss out of me, that created something. Because to get work done through other people sometimes is a chore. Oh. Many times it's easier to do it yourself. But when you're a supervisor, non-union, supervising union, they have to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a different story. It's very so, challenging. So that's another experience I had for roughly 15 years, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And But it's experience that uh, I'll take with me, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. So. Well, well, Mr. Gallo, in conclusion, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, about the, the military experience at all? Any final the, thoughts? The only final thought that I had, once again, not only did I get in, I got in at the right time because I was in at the, uh, uh, World War II was over, okay, in uh, 45, okay. I got in in 51. They had not converted the uh, benefits of World War II soldiers at that time yet. Once I got in, about five months later, they converted to a uh, Korean, which was lesser than the World War II, okay? So I ended up, I ended up converting my life insurance. I have very good life insurance, which is paid up, okay? And I went to school on World War II GI Bill, not the Korean, which gave me a little bit more. Okay, and uh, like I say, it. Uh, and as far as uh, decorations, I have roughly. Let's see, I have three, six. Maybe I have them. I have three, six, seven. Eight, three, six. I have three, six, seven, eight ribbons and two battle stars. So that's my. That is my. Uh, uh, that I use. I belong to the Navy Shipmates, which Marie uh, uh, talked, uh, talked to you about earlier, and uh, we have a nice group there, and I still keep my military uh, things at home, mm -hmm. but that's it. So, so the family uh, continues. The family continues, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give you my story. Well, on behalf of the country, we, we want to thank you for your service to our country and appreciate the effort that you made and a very significant effort and we're pleased to hear that it was as rewarding for you as it was for our country. Thank you for coming with us today. Thank you very much. That concludes our interview. Thank you. Thank you.